Welcome everyone to The Real News Network. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News, and it's so great to have you all with us. The Real News is an independent, viewer-supported, nonprofit media network. We don't take corporate cash, we don't do ads, and we don't put our reporting behind paywalls, which means we need each one of you to become monthly sustainers of our work so we can keep bringing y'all coverage of the voices and issues you care about most. So just head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support and become a supporter today. It really makes a difference. For the past year and a half here on The Real News, we have relentlessly covered the crisis on the nation's freight railroad system from the side that traditionally has been ignored or actively silenced by the corporate media, the workers' side. Here on our YouTube channel, on our podcast feed, and in text articles on our website, we have spoken to current and retired railroad workers across the U.S., from conductors and engineers to carmen, dispatchers, and track maintenance workers. And what we have heard time and again is that the railroads are in the midst of a self-induced crisis that is running workers and the supply chain into the ground all for the sake of record profits for the Class 1 rail carriers and their wealthy executives and Wall Street shareholders. The corporate media, politicians in D.C., and the public at large finally began to take an interest in this story late last year, when the high-stakes contract negotiations involving the rail companies and the 12 craft unions representing around 115,000 workers across the freight rail system reached a critical inflection point. And we, as a country, were staring down the barrel of a very real possibility of a national rail shutdown in September, and then again in late November and early December. And we all know what happened then. At the urging of pro-union President Joe Biden, Democrats and Republicans in Congress voted to undercut workers' ability to strike, forcing them to accept a contract that a critical mass of workers had already rejected. There's no sugarcoating it. The political establishment screwed over railroad workers and essentially gave the rail carriers, which again are seeing record profits, everything they wanted, leaving them basically zero incentive to change their ways or to curtail the voracious, cost-cutting, profit-maximizing schemes that workers had been sounding the alarm about to anyone who would listen. Then... The catastrophic Norfolk Southern train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, happened in early February of this year, and the entire country got a horrifying look at what workers were warning about. As Mike L., a veteran carman, wrote in an op-ed that we published here at The Real News in March, quote, what is perhaps most devastating about the East Palestine disaster is the fact that it was avoidable. Norfolk Southern has spent the last five years deferring maintenance, furloughing employees, rushing inspections, cutting corners on repairs, and threatening and retaliating against employees who didn't comply with any of the directives put in place to accomplish their ultimate goal of an operating ratio below 60%. Those of us who work in the rail industry knew it was only a matter of time before a disaster like this happened. Unfortunately, we were ignored. And the people of East Palestine, like, as of this week, the people of Raymond, Minnesota, are the ones paying for it. End quote. Now, these events have focused on the railroads a level of public scrutiny they haven't been subjected to in quite some time. And with each passing week as news of more train derailments filters into public view, we are seeing renewed calls by rail workers and others to nationalize the railroads. As journalist Carrie Leiterson recently wrote in a blockbuster cover story for the magazine In These Times, quote, The threatened railroad strike underscores how much the U.S. economy depends on freight railroads. It also exposes the fragility of a system owned and run in large part by four massively profitable carrier companies that act as de facto monopolies. BNSF and Union Pacific run the vast majority of freight west of the Mississippi River, while Norfolk Southern and CSX run most of the freight to the east. 
In 2021, BNSF and Union Pacific reported record profits of $6.5 billion and $6 billion, respectively, while Norfolk Southern reported a record $4.45 billion and CSX notched $3.8 billion. The profit is doled out to highly paid executives and shareholders with too little invested back into operations and infrastructure, as many workers and some industry experts see it. The imbalance has helped make the case for more decision-making power for railroad workers and a greater oversight role for the public. Railroad workers who support nationalization would like to see workers in direct leadership positions and think removing the profit motive would translate to better working conditions. End quote. All right, so let's talk about these calls to nationalize the railroads. Where are they coming from? Are they really as radical as some have made them out to be? And what could nationalization actually look like in practice? To talk about all of this and more, I'm honored to be joined today on The Real News by two very special guests. First up, we have Carrie Leiterson herself. Carrie is a Chicago-based journalist, author, and assistant professor at Northwestern University, where she leads the investigative specialization at the Medill School of Journalism, Media, Integrated Marketing, Communications. She's the author of numerous books, including Mayor 1%, Rahm Emanuel and the Rise of Chicago's 99%, and Closing the Cloud Factories, Lessons from the Fight to Shut Down Chicago's Coal Plants. We're also joined once again on The Real News by Ron Kamenko. Until recently, Ron served as General Secretary of Railroad Workers United. Prior to hiring out as a brakeman with Conrail in 1996, Ron served as president of AFSCME Local 634 in Madison, Wisconsin. In 2005, Ron helped to found Railroad Operating Crafts United, an RWU predecessor. A former brakeman, conductor, and engineer for Conrail and later NS in Chicago, he formerly worked for Amtrak in Milwaukee and Chicago. He currently is working as an Amtrak engineer in Reno, Nevada, where he is the vice president of BLET Local 51. Ron, Kerry, thank you both so much for joining me today on The Real News. I really appreciate it. Okay, so, you know, we got a lot to talk about here. And I feel like, you know, as I said in that intro, right, we've been really sort of trying to cover the news on the railroads as it comes out from workers' perspectives. But since I have both of you all on, I want to kind of take a bit of a bird's eye view here, right, and, and talk about this question of nationalization. But I guess by way of, of setting us up to do that, you know, so much has happened in the past two years or so regarding the railroads. And I, I think it's important for us to kind of stop and take stock of where we are right now and how we got here. And, you know, since we want this to kind of be a more evergreen discussion that folks can return to, I wanted to use this first time around the table to sort of break down what we have seen recently on the railroads, from mass layoffs and furloughs over the past six years to COVID-19, to the contract fight uh, and Biden and Congress's intervention, to the catastrophic derailment in East Palestine. What do so like? Can we go around um, starting with Carrie and and then you, Ron? Let's just like refresh everyone's memory and try to kind of take stock of of all the news about the railroads that we've been seeing, like, and just re like refresh v viewers' memory about um, what the current state of the freight rail industry is. Well, that's a, a great and a huge topic. And I know Ron could give you, uh, you know, from the day one of the railroad industry up until now, a great uh, encyclopedic um, answer. So maybe I'll leave most of it to him. But I'll say, especially as a journalist, you know, coming into it, uh, I've gotten the chance um, starting when, you know, back when RW started 15 or more years ago to really learn a lot about the railroad industry, but still as a relative, um, you know, layperson and newcomer to it, I think the things that are most striking about the current situation is one, how the railroads, even as the, the, these major carrier companies, even as they've become more and more profitable, they've been scaling back their service and carrying less freight and of course doing it with fewer people and really just sowing dissatisfaction, not only among the workers, which is kind of more expected and something you see in so many industries, but also among their 
customers, the um, the shippers that are relying on railroads to ship things, and then by extension, the public, they may not know what role railroad, di railroad dysfunction has in the supply chain issues and in the high prices they're paying and in other things that affect their lives. But um, really, everyone is directly affected by this dysfunction that the major companies have um, entirely caused in their pursuit of profit. Uh, and that was really clear um, in numerous ways, but including at these hearings last April that the federal government held um, where workers and union leaders and shippers themselves who, you know, aren't necessarily usually on the same page, they really had the same complaints about the way the railroad companies were doing business and the shippers were, were bringing up the same issues the workers were bringing up. And, you know, they may or may not have actually cared about the workers' well-being, but they were seeing that the way the industry is structured and the way the workers are treated was directly resulting in poor service um, for the shippers who are trying to move their goods and all the industries that rely on these goods. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. And I know Ron has a ton more to say. Yeah, well, thanks, Carrie. Um, like you say, the rail industry has pissed off a lot of people and they have historically, of course, been pissing off the railroad workforce uh, since the 1870s, uh, we saw the country's first general strike in 1877, led by railroad workers, and then a whole series of strikes, both large and small, throughout the 1880s, right into the 20th century. And so uh, the first labor law, really, that was passed in this country that allowed unions to actually be legally recognized was the Railway Labor Act in 1926. And it was to provide labor peace because the rail industry and its workers were constantly at war. Um, and it wasn't in the interest of the nation as a whole. Uh, and one could say it wasn't in the interest of the rail industry either or in the railroad workforce. So anyway, we, without getting into the Railway Labor Act, fast forward to today, or at least the last five to 10 years. And we've seen the rail industry make uh, enemies of many of its shippers and large and small. So lots of small ones have simply defected to the highway because they have been priced out of the market by rail. Uh, the service is so lousy if you're a small shipper who wants to ship a boxcar load of lumber a week, let's say. The rail industry is not that interested in you because the rate of return on investment is less than the average operating ratio that Max had talked about. And so if your little business shipping one or two carloads a week or even a month are making the company, oh, 10 or 20 cents on the dollar, that's not good enough. That's actually dragging down the corporate operating ratio. So it's alienated small shippers, but it's also alienated big ones like Foster Farms in California that gets grain trains by the train load. And Union Pacific was incapable of delivering these trains on time. Uh, some of you all might remember back this summer, it was a crisis where Foster Farms was in danger of literally losing millions of animals potentially uh, because grain was not able to be delivered. So the Surface Transportation Board had to get involved. But it wasn't just agricultural shippers. It's those who are shipping fertilizers and finished steel, automobiles, uh, recycling, energy, coal, most of the big um, uh, shippers groups have complained vociferously to the Surface Transportation Board. Now, as for railroad workers, which are, you know, is, is Railroad Workers United's prime interest here, um, you can talk to 120,000 uh, railroad workers, whether they be dispatchers, car inspectors, machinists, electricians, or hostlers who work in the diesel house, conductors and engineers who work aboard the locomotive, or track workers or signal maintainers in the field or any of the other crafts that I might have left out. And you will get an echo, uh, pretty much uh, the same theme. We are overworked, we are mistreated, we are not given time off, we are faced with endless uh, rules and regulations, we are faced with harsh discipline. Um, the situation is always changing. We're expected to keep up with it. Um, the railroad industry is not uh, interested in our health and apparently not interested in our safety. And we are working longer and longer hours 
and we're not given the tools, we're not given the instruction and the training uh, to do the job properly. And this has reached, I would consider, fairly universal proportion. So therefore, Railroad Workers United, uh, who entered this uh, the field about 15 years ago, and we've discussed this ultimate question of, of ownership and would it make sense for the railroads to be publicly owned like they are in much of the rest of the world. And up until a couple years ago, Max, uh, there was no consensus, there was no sense that this would be a solution. A number of railroad workers still felt that their, uh, their best bet uh, was in the private ownership of the railroads. Uh, we won't go into all the reasons for that, but those reasons I think have largely eroded and melted away. We believe that railroad workers are fairly unanimous that what's work, what we have right now today is not working. The railroads have made a mess of the industry. We are not happy uh, with their management uh, and public ownership could solve many of our problems and many of the industry's problems. And so last fall, we officially came out in support of a publicly owned worker run railroad system in the United States. Oh, yeah. So I, I want to talk about this, you know, resolution that RWU signed on to specifically in a second. And and like I said, we're going to round out by really kind of talking through what we mean when we say nationalize the railroads, right? That can mean a number of different things. And in fact, if you look at American history or, you know, if you look at examples abroad, you can see that there are a number of ways that we could approach this question of nationalizing the railroads. But before we get there, I wanted to kind of build on uh, what y'all were saying and and really sort of make the case as Carrie does in, in her incredible uh, in-depth piece for In These Times, which everyone should go read. Uh, y'all should also, if you haven't already, go back and, and listen to, watch and read all of the different interviews with railroad workers that we have published here at the Real News Network. Uh, we don't have time to kind of get into everything there. Um, but I think if you read Carrie's piece, if you go back and listen to those interviews, it'll become clear uh, why, right, so many folks are calling for nationalizing the railroads. But I guess in case anyone is still sort of uh, unsure about that, I wanted to go back around the table and, and ask us to sort of make that case, right? Like, let, let's talk about why everything we're talking about here, you know, points towards the need for nationalization, Right. Um, because, you know, it's just it, there's so much here to to consider. Um, but just to kind of sum up again, what what the three of us were already uh, telling you guys, you know, the the nation's freight rail system, you know, has been subject to uh, kind of a, a long brewing trend of corporate consolidation and de facto uh, shared monop monopolies across the country. Um, this has led to kind of regional monopolies for certain carriers uh, who have been able to kind of, you know, have a stranglehold on a vital part of the supply chain, uh, cost or, you know, passing on whatever costs they want to shippers uh, who have no choice but to ship, you know, products on the rails. You can't unload all of that onto, uh, you know, the, the highways on trucks and stuff like that. Um, so you have kind of like a captive industry. Uh, held captive by what is effectively a, an oligopolistic cartel of the major craft one or uh, class one freight rail carriers uh, who are, uh, as of you know, the past few decades, uh, you know, slavishly beholden to their uh, Wall Street shareholders and Wall Street minded executives who have been pushing this sort of cult of the operating ratio that we've talked about relentlessly here on The Real News, right? Cutting operating costs year after year after year. What does that mean? Cut your workforce, uh, disinvest or, or not invest enough in track maintenance, in uh, car repair, in, in, you know, checking, maintaining and updating, um, you know, tech technologies like the uh, hotbox detectors, um, which were a big uh, you know, topic of discussion around the East Palestine uh, train derailment as well. And so what that leads to is just more work being piled on to fewer workers who have less time to do that work uh, and who face 
you know, relentless kind of uh, hounding from management to meet quotas, uh, along with um, draconian attendance policies that are created and implemented to uh, basically like, you know, hold workers captive uh, in these sorts of conditions because the railroads have cut uh, all the reserve workers uh, who would normally like be there to offer support and relief in case anyone got sick or couldn't make uh, their their call or anything like that. So you have like, again, just all of this perfect storm brewing and all of it is really driven by this sort of profit maximizing, uh, uh, you know, fever um, coming from, you know, the railroad carriers and their shareholders. So I wanted to ask you guys, yeah, if we could say a little more um, from the derailments we're seeing, not just in East Palestine, uh, but beyond uh, the, you know, uh, like everything that workers have been telling us about how they're burning out, quitting the industry it, reportedly in record numbers, uh, either fleeing to passenger service or leaving the industry altogether. Um, you know, how does all of this, all of what we're talking about here, um, like make the case for nationalization? And, and, you know, I know folks, especially in this country, may be very skeptical of the question of nationalization. That's something that I would have been skeptical of uh, growing up as a conservative. And as Kerry rightly points out in her In These Times article, after, you know, seeing what Biden and Congress did to the railroad workers, I think we have a lot of reason to be skeptical about the question of nationalization. But let's talk about why the issues we're already talking about and the issues we've been seeing on the freight railroads of late why does that, you know, like kind of underscore the need for us to have a serious conversation about nationalization rather than leave the industry in the hands of these corporate oligarchs like we currently do? Well, I think on the most basic level, um, the events of the past year drove home just how crucial the freight railroad industry is to the country functioning at all. So I think you can put it in the same bucket as healthcare and education and uh, highways, um, public utilities, things that for the most part... um, are government run or have been, and then, you know, things like healthcare and education, you see trends to privatize them. But anyway, um, these really crucial industries, it just makes sense on the most basic level that uh, revenue, the service will be better, the public will be better served if revenue is rolled back into, um, into the actual operations and making things as environmental as possible and as safe as possible and treating workers well. And, you know, when you have things like healthcare and education that are privatized, that were public and are privatized, or you look in other countries where, um, where railroads were public, but were privatized, um, you almost inevitably see problems, things becoming less safe, um, less effective, less desirable. Uh, So it it just makes sense that all those massive profits that the shareholders of these companies are getting, if those profits were reinvested into actually improving railroads, like, of course, they would run better and they would serve the public better. It's, It's it just seems like a no brainer. And then there's also the issue of um, logistical coordination. And we haven't even mentioned um, passenger rail, but that's part of this too, that obviously Ron can talk a lot about, but um, the service, if you have, I mean, as you mentioned or alluded to, the government doesn't necessarily always do a great job of running things or coordinating things. But um, right now you have these different companies who own the tracks and are competing with each other and well, not, not competing enough in some ways since they're virtual monopolies, but um, have, you know, their own motives to make profits. Whereas if you had a, an entity uh, like the public um, representatives of the public who had the ability to run the whole system as one unified system and make decisions about where the trains run and when they run and how you can most effectively um, serve all the interests out there, uh, if that's done well, that would clearly be better than having this mishmash privately run structure where this massive private profit motive um, underlies everything. So uh, I think the, you know, big picture, the why, um, it would be hard to argue, you know, with those whys. Um, When you get to a more granular and political level, you know, it's a different story. But um, it just almost seems like common sense that this is the sort of uh, sector that should be nationalized. Yeah. 
the big picture, it makes sense, just like highways are publicly owned, and I don't think too many people would want to see them privatized. Our river system in this country, uh, massive amounts of freight go up and down the Ohio River, the Mississippi, Missouri. I don't think we would want to see our rivers sold off. And so the idea of the railroads being publicly owned, if you look at it through that prism, uh, is not that extraordinary a prospect. But rather than get into at this point, like why it's good for the environment, why it's good for, for the expansion of, of passenger rail, uh, why it is good for so-called transportation justice, why it's good for shippers, uh, and why it's good for the rail industry itself, uh, right now, I'll just talk about why public ownership would be good for workers. Uh, so railroad workers did have a brief experiment with public ownership back in the 19 teens for a couple of years. And the railroads were in effect nationalized by the US government because they couldn't deliver uh, for the war effort and meet the needs of the nation during World War I. So they were temporarily quote unquote nationalized. As this was coming to a close, the Wilson Woodrow Wilson administration was ready to put the railroads back into private hands. Every single rail union and 99% of the railroad workers who voted in a mass plebiscite uh, of hundreds of thousands, uh, the vote was overwhelmingly in favor of keeping the railroads in public ownership and running them according to this thing called the Plum Plan. So anyway, rail labor has an actual history of supporting public ownership after its brief experience uh, with what it taught them uh, back in the teens over 100 years ago. And once again, we'll fast forward to today and look at what we have endured. So in some sense, Max, it's the devil you know versus the devil that you don't. And the devil that we know right now has caused job cuts in the last four or five years alone of 30 to 40% in the various crafts across the board. For those who didn't lose a position, they lost years, if not decades of seniority, ended up back on the extra board, back on a lower paying job, uh, back on a more difficult job, uh, in other words, their job prospects took a dive as a result of the private rail industry's uh, search for greater and greater profits. Uh, now we're facing constant threats to the two-person crew. And rail industries made it clear if it had its way, uh, there would be no more two-person crew. There'd only be one. And they've made no bones about the fact they'd like to see the trains run with nobody aboard them. So now you're looking at even more job cuts and at some point, the railroad retirement system is going to be threatened. And it's something that's near and dear to the hearts of every railroad worker. If you don't have workers paying into it, guess what? You don't get a retirement annuity. And so every railroad worker is concerned about these ever plunging levels of, of employment. And that seems to be what we're faced with in a future of private ownership. Um, we're dealing with these ever, ever longer trains. They're more difficult to handle. They beat the hell out of the track. They seem to derail with a greater frequency. The derailments are more severe. So it's a more dangerous situation in, in that and, and many other ways uh, on the railroad. Uh, we're all working longer hours. There's more overtime, uh, longer tours of duty for trainmen and enginemen. Um, and the hostility that the rail industry has shown to passenger rail expansion, uh, the one place that's a bright spot where uh, railroad jobs could be expanding uh, in passenger rail. And the class ones have made it very, very clear through their word and deed uh, that they're very uh, opposed to more Amtrak frequencies and more Amtrak routes uh, running passenger trains, getting in the way of their 15,000 foot freight trains out on the main line. Um, we're moving less freight. 16 years ago in 2006, not only did we have a boatload more employees, but we were moving 20% more freight than we are today. So the rail industry is actually sabotaging the railroad industry itself for the sake of these short-term profits. And once again, that means less jobs uh, for railroad workers, 
uh, less jobs for our sons and daughters, uh, and so forth. Um, draconian attendance policies. Uh, they started to come in when I was hiring into the railroad back in the 90s. And I watched in horror as BNSF unveiled the first availability policy. I was not working for BNSF. And I remember all of us thinking, thank goodness we don't work for them. Well, the new attendance policy that came out just last year uh, was way worse. And this seems to be the wave of the future. Uh, even though they're in a state of retreat right now because they got a black eye from it, they have made it clear that they expect us to be at work uh, on time, no grace period, every day, uh, or suffer the consequences. And then the failure to invest in the industry. The railroad has squandered the last 20 years where all the profits have gone to dividends, CEO pay, stock buybacks, that could have gone to electrifying, double tracking, siding lengthening, so that we could be getting freight off the highway and back on the rail where it belongs. But instead, like I pointed out, we're moving 20% less freight. We should be moving more. There should be more railroad jobs, not the 30% less that we're seeing. And so it's, it's, it's a sad situation for railroad workers. <clears throat> now a railroad worker may make the case, yeah, well, that's better than having the government own the railroads. I would postulate at this stage of the game, things have gotten so bad that most railroad workers, uh, even the most uh, anti-government, uh, anti-public ownership, uh, would still uh, wager on public ownership simply because what do we have to lose at this stage of the game? The rail industry has made it very clear the direction they want to go in that direction is not in our interest. Personally, I would say, no matter what your political views are, if you work for the railroad, it's time to roll the dice and say, look, nothing could be worse than what we're facing today. Let's go with public ownership. I think that's powerfully put as always. And, you know, I think like it's really, you know, important, right, to, to, kind of consider that, right? I mean, because again, we understand, I understand and feel myself, right? Many, you know, reservations when I hear like, let's nationalize this or let's have the government take over this. Again, I was, I was, you know, raised uh, very conservative. So some of that is just like muscle memory, but also because I've seen how much the government can screw things up as well. And I know that people in good faith will ask questions like, well, you know, isn't that just going to mean that, you know, the, the government or whoever is like kind of publicly owning the railroads, it's going to be less efficient. Shouldn't we let the market kind of dictate how this industry is run, the market knows all, it's the most efficient, yada, 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 right? And I just kind of think back to, again, um, the, the way that the high stakes contract negotiations last year, and at that point, we were basically three years into the negotiations, um, right? Those negotiations didn't just start happening last year. But when it all kind of came crashing down with Joe Biden and Congress, you know, uh, uh, forcing a contract down workers' throats, the, the line that we kept hearing from the White House on down was that the railroads are too important to our economy. They're too vital to our supply chain to allow workers to strike on the railroads. And I feel like the obvious retort was, well, if that's the case, if the railroads are too important to allow workers to strike, then they are too goddamn important to be left in the hands of corporate and Wall Street vampires who are running it into the ground for the sake of their bottom line. Like, like I feel like I'm going nuts here, right? But I mean, it feels like this logic when we talk about the market, you know, or we talk about the importance of the supply chain, it only goes one way. And like, we never actually like hold the carriers themselves to the same standard that we are holding unions and workers to. And the thing is, as we've been saying already, and as we talked about um, with the derailment in East Palestine, like this is all of our problems, 
You know, this this is this is these trains aren't running through, you know, the backyards and and town squares of rich enclaves and and wealthy suburbs. They're running through working class communities. They're running through our communities. They're running past our schools and our baseball fields. We're the ones who are sitting in traffic waiting for these three mile long trains to pass by. Right. We are the ones who are left dealing with the fallout if and when these trains that are way too long to be on the rails and have way too few people operating them, if something happens and they derail, if they crash, or if there's a toxic spill, what have you, you know, we're the ones who are having to deal with the fallout of that. And you can see examples of this everywhere. Remember, dear viewers and listeners, uh, it was about a year ago, a little over a year ago, when the entire corporate media was like losing its collective mind, uh, when a train in Los Angeles, you know, had uh, been looted. And we, everyone was talking about a crime wave and, and, you know, like, how could this possibly happen? What the media wasn't telling you is that just weeks prior to that, Union Pacific had just gone through another round of layoffs, laying off thousands of more workers. So you had a train like the one in L.A., which workers also said was like, you know, way too long. So that's why it was sticking all the way out that far. There were barely, you know, any people working on that train. So it's like kind of a sitting duck for looters and stuff like that. Right. So that's just one little example of how the the what the um, rail carriers have been doing to the supply chain and to the rail workers directly translates to the stuff that you are seeing and experiencing every day. East Palestine is another. Right. I know everyone wants to like kind of say that, oh, this was a freak accident because of, uh, you know, a, a faulty bearing. Yes. Like, you know, there's there's some truth to that. But as the folks that we've talked to have said over and over again, right? You know, you also have, uh, you know, uh, you could have caught this before a catastrophic derailment like East Palestine happened if, you know, we hadn't been relentlessly cutting, uh, you know, the car men who are inspecting, you know, these cars. If we hadn't been, you know, replacing, you know, and outsourcing, you know, track maintenance and, and um, stuff like that. Um, with technology and we're also cutting the staff of the dispatchers so like the signal coming from a hot box to a dispatcher is going to take more time to marshal a response so like you know all these kind of staff cuts again they increase the likelihood uh, of derailments like this happening they dampen the uh, response time um, and again they're putting all of us at hazard so I think like as Ron said and as Carrie said like you know all of our reservations, you know, notwithstanding, we need to look at like what's around us and ask like, well, it, are we fine with more of this? Right. Because as it happens right now, like, you know, the, the rail carriers really don't have a whole lot of incentive to change. And so um, building off that is I could talk to you guys for days, but I know I can't keep you for too long. Let's let's talk about now that we've gotten through the why of nationalization. Right. And, and why people should at least consider nationalization as opposed to the kind of corporate captured, you know, shared oligopoly system that we've got right now. Let's talk a little bit about the how. Right. And Carrie goes into this in great depth in her In These Times article and uh, Railroad Workers United, as as we aforementioned, uh, even kind of put out a call, you know, like uh, signing on for a resolution calling for railroad nationalization. I wanted to ask you guys, um, Ron, you already gave us one historical example, right, during World War I, where the railroads were effectively nationalized. And in fact, rail workers wanted to keep them nationalized. But, you know, the, the tycoons and companies uh, and capitalist interests like couldn't uh, allow that to happen. So I guess for folks out there who are maybe at least open to entertaining, uh, you know, the question of nationalization, let's talk a little bit about what that could look like. Is this just the government taking everything? Is it, you know, like the government owning the rails? Is it a democratic cooperative ownership model, you know, uh, where workers are the ones kind of making those decisions? Um, do we have other examples uh, in the U.S. or beyond that we could sort of look to to kind of think about what this could look like? So we don't have to talk about everything under the sun, because I, I know this is a big question, but just let's let's go back around the table and talk a little bit about what practically railroad nationalization could look like. Yeah. So in, in terms of 
how nationalization could actually happen, people might be surprised to know that we actually, the public, the government has nationalized many industries throughout history, including railroads, as Ron mentioned, um, even department stores, telecommunications, steel mills, coal mines, all kinds of essential industries have been nationalized. Um, it, the difference is that this was usually during times of war or other emergency times, and it was usually meant to be temporary. And these uh, nationalizations usually did have good results, as Ron mentioned, with the railroads during World War I. Um, in a lot of cases, changes in the industry were made for the better during the public's ownership, um, but they did in most cases revert back to private ownership. So with the railroads, we're talking about something that would be much longer term. And um, the idea that the government, the public again, would, um, as opponents would surely frame it, seize these companies, seize this private property and run the whole system, um, that's unlikely to happen any time soon. Um, but the, the first step that does seem like something we could contemplate is that the government, the public, would own and run the tracks and the infrastructure and basically have the responsibility and the right and the obligation to manage this system to um, have some role in, in setting prices and making sure that shippers um, have access to this this public service uh, and be able to coordinate schedules in the most efficient and logical way, be, protect workers' rights um, for sure, top priority. Um, so, you know, not only actually own the infrastructure, just like the government owns highways and waterways, but also manage and highly regulate it. And then you can still have the private companies. So you're not liquidating these companies. Um, they could still make plenty of profit uh, operating within this structure. Um, and you probably could even introduce more competition in that sense, too, for the, you know, the people that think market competition is, is the way to go. Um, and who knows, maybe down the line, there's a way that that transitions into even fuller public ownership. Um, there's other models of nationalization out there, too. There's been calls to nationalize the fossil fuel industry by basically having the public um, buy up stock, you know, own a majority of shares in fossil fuel companies and then be able to clean them up or shut them down or whatever it may be because they're majority owners. Um, that's the kind of thing that could happen with railroads, too, uh, theoretically that seems less exciting to me and to a lot of other people because that's just sort of operating within these structures that have proved so problematic already. Um, but uh, I think, you know, that also the fact that and during the, the auto bailout and insurance bailouts in the past recessions, the government has actually done this, has taken a controlling interest in companies, including by giving them a bunch of money to um, to take those temporary uh, controlling interests. So, you know, again, that's just more proof that this isn't such an unprecedented thing to think about. Um, but the idea that the public could own and, and run the railroads, um, even having, you know, BNSF, CSX, these companies still operating on them uh, it is not that uh, far afield. And then, of course, making sure that workers, um, how, how the public runs it and making sure that workers are, you know, in the driver's seat um, would be so crucial. And I'm, I'm sure that's something that Ron can talk a lot more about. So I would start by saying that there's as many different ways that you can run a private rail system as you could run a public one. And as Carrie laid out, there's a number of different models or options that have existed uh, when, when industries, not just rail, uh, have been taken into public ownership. But if you look at a brief history of the rail industry in our country, um, what we see is that the rail industry has been either not regulated at all or lightly regulated or heavily regulated at different times in its existence. It's still been a private industry, but it has operated in a number of different manners uh, based upon the restrictions, the regulations uh, placed upon it by the federal government. So turning to public ownership, I would say, yeah, there is a endless number of different mo models that we could uh, work from. And I'm sure that lots of different railroad workers and lots of different environmental activists 
and other political people have their own idea of how they would like to see uh, the rail industry come into public ownership and control. I'm fairly partial right now to what's called the Plum Plan. And this was the plan that rail labor supported. Plum actually was an attorney who was on retainer uh, by rail unions back in the day, 100 years ago, and was this huge advocate for public ownership. There's a small book here of 30 pages. It's an easy read called Labor's Plan for Government Ownership and Democracy in the Operation of the Railroads. And one of the key things about the Plum Plan uh, was that it provided for a board of directors that would be one third railroad managers, professional railroad managers, and it would be one third government appointees, and it would be one third workers, which is to say representatives of the organized railroad workforce. And so, these 21 odd individuals, let's say seven from each sector, uh, would govern the railroad board. Now, if you look at the board today of class one railroads, you don't see any workers. Uh, there are no public officials or, or uh, public servants, um, uh, but, but, and, and not even too many railroad managers, actually. Uh, what you see is uh, people on boards who are uh, professional um, Wall Street hedge fund managers and others. And so I think most Americans, given our basic uh, predisposition towards democracy, participation, no taxation without representation, all of these things that we hold near and dear, would kind of like this idea. Now, I would add that in the, in the public appointees, these could be representatives, for example, also including uh, passenger operations experts, a representative from Amtrak, or maybe the president of Amtrak, um, perhaps the head of the uh, interior department or the environmental protection agencies, um, individuals who represent shippers, for example, who now are not represented whatsoever on the boards of directors of current day class one privately held railroads. And so if you start to examine the Plum Plan as just a taking off point, keeping in mind that it was 100 years ago, so there's lots of tweaks and changes that we would advocate. And, you know, the devil's definitely in the details. But this model would be one that one would suspect would operate the industry far more efficiently, far more in the interest of its workers, its shippers, passengers, consumers, trackside communities, uh, the nation as a whole. And in fact, it would actually operate in the interest of the rail industry because rather than paying out exorbitant profits and bonuses and engaging in stock buybacks, the tens of billions of dollars would be spent on double tracking and electrification and modern high horsepower AC traction, uh, electrified locomotives uh, and all the rest. And so examining the plum plan, you start to actually get a sense of how democratic it would be for workers, shippers, uh, and other uh, uh, interest groups to actually be running the nation's railroads as opposed to just a handful of hedge fund managers who are interested in next quarter's uh, profit picture. So that's, that's kind of what I, I think we should start from. And not only because it's a model that exists, um, but at the time it was incredibly popular. Every railroad union supported it, as I mentioned earlier, the miners union, the steel workers, uh, the AFL-CIO as a whole at its convention, I believe in 1919 or 1920, the delegates voted overwhelmingly to support public ownership of the railroads, the energy industry, um, and many other aspects uh, of American economy. So um, something to start with, something to work for, and something that I certainly uh, see as a, as a great taking off point for the ideas of public ownership of the railroads.
Hell yeah. And uh, man, I got so many ideas going through my head just off of that and and really encourage folks to to kind of look more into this. Um, follow Railroad Workers United. Read Carrie's great piece for In These Times. Ask the tough questions. But I promise you, you'll find a lot of interesting answers that um, may surprise you. Right. I mean, I think we've covered a lot of the potential benefits for, you know, a policy of nationalizing the railroads, putting the railroads under um, public ownership instead of having them driven by this voracious profit motive, uh, serving you know the bottom lines and and lining the pockets of wealthy executives and Wall Street shareholders. There's some that we haven't covered as much, right? I mean, in fact, there used to be a lot of other rail lines in operation, but they were less profitable, and so those get closed down, right? <laughs> you know, for the same reason that uh, you know trains have been getting longer and longer and heavier and heavier, right? You know, it's not efficient, you know, but it is, uh, you know, like it, it, it helps the bottom line. Right. And so we could expand rail in this country. We could, as both Ron and Carrie have mentioned, uh, we could electrify, you know, the rail systems. We could have, you know, we could be talking about high speed rail and, and like, you know, going all over the country like they have in China. Instead, we're talking about how our infrastructure is falling apart and our trains are exploding, poisoning entire uh, communities like East Palestine, Ohio, and right on the border with Pennsylvania. Right. So these are these are the kind of the two past that we're talking about here. And there's so much to consider, uh, you know, so many benefits to consider, even if the practicals of getting to nationalization are very hairy. But I think as Ron uh, put it so aptly before, you know, how much worse do things need to get with the current system before we actually start considering other alternatives? And Ron, Kerry, um, by way of rounding out, I just wanted to quickly ask y'all um, if uh, you had any other final thoughts on um, where folks can go to learn more about this, uh, where they can go to find more of your work and to stay uh, up to date with um, what's going on on the rails. Well, In These Times is, is such a wonderful publication. I feel really lucky to work with. They cover this and related issues um, really well all the time. And uh, Railroad Workers United is where I learned so much of this. And are, they're just a, a wonderful resource um, for anybody. Thanks, Carrie. I would have to agree. Um, and for those who haven't gone to our website, railroadworkersunited.org, uh, it's the Library of Information. You can also sign up. There'll be a pop-up that comes up within the first five seconds. You can easily sign up to get weekly uh, news uh, on a regular basis from us as to what's going on in the rail industry, what's going on in rail labor and the larger labor movement as well. Um, and then specifically on the question of public ownership of the railroads, if you scroll down the links, you will come to RWU campaigns the first one in the drop down menu is public ownership of the railroad. So if you click on that, you can be connected to a series of links to dozens and dozens of articles, uh, interviews like this one, uh, TV and radio clips and more, as well as a list of endorsing organizations. Right now we have officially about three dozen organizations uh, who have signed on in support of the campaign and the effort uh, and lots of information. You can also see the plum plan and other information. So a great resource for anybody who's interested in learning more about public ownership of the railroads. So that is the great Carrie Leiderson and Ron Kamenko. Carrie is a Chicago based journalist, author and assistant professor at Northwestern University where she leads the investigative specialization at the Medill School of Journalism, Media, Integrated Marketing Communications. She's the author of numerous books, including Mayor 1%, Rahm Emanuel and the Rise of Chicago's 99%, and Closing the Cloud Factories, Lessons from the Fight to Shut Down Chicago's Coal Plants. Ron Kamiko, until recently, served as General Secretary of Railroad Workers United, Prior to hiring out as a brakeman with Conrail in 1996, he served as president of AFSME Local 634 in Madison, Wisconsin. In 2005, Ron helped to found Railroad Operating Crafts United, an RWU predecessor. A former brakeman, conductor, and engineer for Conrail and later NS in Chicago, he formerly worked for Amtrak in Milwaukee and Chicago. 
He currently is working as an Amtrak engineer in Reno, Nevada, where he is the vice president of the BLET Local 51. Ron, Carrie, thank you both so much for joining me today on The Real News. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Max. you so much. It's great as always. For all of you watching, this is Maximilian Alvarez. Before you go, please head on over to therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly sustainer of our work so we can keep bringing you important coverage and conversations just like this. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.